guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models Memories Weekly, episode 84. Models Memories is a show about nothing and is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargame experiences from the week. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you put out three activities a week. <clears throat> How? Could I possibly have more to say? Well, I do, and here goes. This week, Games Workshop showed off a whole bunch of super interesting new things, but first I want to talk about... I painted 200 zombies! Every now and then, I, I get myself into a situation like this where I have a neat idea. Why don't I paint just an ungodly amount of stuff? Because stuff tends to pile up around here. And I painted some zombies. The video just came out this Wednesday, and I am very happy with them. I got to play around with some oils, which I am still not very good at. I think I've tried oils maybe six or seven times, really. And really, I don't think I'll have a good grasp of them until I'm like... 50 to 100 models deep into oil painting, but I really like how these suckers turned out, and I'm very excited. Again, I've had this idea forever to have tons and tons of zombies because you play enough war games, you start to know how things go. Orcs versus, you know, I'm gonna lose against orcs, I'm gonna lose against Eldar, I'm gonna lose against Dark Eldar, I'm gonna lose against Chaos Space Marines, I'm just going to lose because I always lose. But introducing some fun narrative zombies into the mix. I am really excited about how that's gonna go. I have so many ideas in my head of how I can use them in game. I think I'm gonna create brand spanking new rules for the zombies because I don't just wanna take the rules for pox walkers or take the rules for like the Warhammer zombies. Maybe the Warhammer zombie rules are fine. Another thing is I have 200 and so I'm starting to worry about movement. And so I'm wondering if I'm either gonna get movement trays which is funny because these models actually already came with uh, square bases to meant to be used with movement trays. But I wonder maybe the Games Workshop Apocalypse movement trays, just so that they don't all have to move individually because that could really slow down the game. If there's probably 100 zombies on the board to start with and then it goes up to 200 zombies by the end of the game, it's gonna be a real chore to measure and move every single zombie individually. So I think maybe they'll move in packs. Star Wars Legion has a really interesting way of movement that a lot of people really don't like. The way movement works in Star Wars Legion is your hero character per squad, your sergeant or your leader, you move him by measuring using the, the Star Wars Legion measuring tools, and then you just move the rest of the squad to fill it in. I like that because it's really, really quick, it's really easy, and I don't like fiddling around, but some people don't like that because it feels maybe a little less thematic. You don't, you're not moving every single guy individually, and it kind of boils the entire squad down to one model and the other models are essentially just wound tokens. I sort of see it both ways, but I tend to think less rules make things a lot more thematic. Uh, I would like in playing games like Dead Zone by Mantic, also Mantic, the makers of these wonderful zombies. Uh, in Dead Zone, I feel like the game is a lot more thematic because there's far less rules. And so if you want to do something fun, like shoot a flamethrower at something, you just move the guy and shoot the flamethrower. And that feels like I am that guy and I'm going around the corner and then I'm gonna light up the enemy with my flamethrower and we'll see what happens. As opposed to like I'm playing Warhammer 40,000, I have my Black Templar and I'm like, okay, my sword brethren have chain swords, but I'm gonna use the stratagem Might of the Emperor to give those chain swords a plus one to hit. And I'm standing within six inches of Helbrecht and so I'm gonna use his ability, uh, Faith of the Imperium, to bolster the wound rolls and so now I'm rolling one extra dice to hit, and I'm re-rolling wounds, that once you start to add in all of those uh, modifications, it starts to feel a little bit more like a card game where I'm building a deck or I'm building a an action as opposed to just I'm a dude doing something. But anyway, zombies. I am really excited to get these zombies in some games. I'll have to, I'll have to, I have a, I have a friend, Sean. Maybe he could come up with some some good zombie rules because he's kind of got a, a mind for rules. I remember I once put together a, um, a a narrative campaign for the game Star Wars X-Wing, which is one of the greatest miniature games ever made. It was called Flash Wars. I even created like a little rule book with artwork and stuff. And uh, we were playing it one afternoon and we were having a good time and you had to pick your list and you were able to acquire points to be able to get different ships in your list. And Sean took one flip through that rule book and said, okay, I'm only gonna bring TIE Advanced X1s. And every time I upgrade, I'm gonna bring another TIE Advanced X1. The game doesn't work, let's stop playing. Which was annoying that day, but it might mean that he would actually be uh, a good resource for writing some rules. Now I'm sad. Anyway, let's take a look at what Games Workshop came out with this week. Games Workshop showed off a new tank for the Imperial Guard, the Rogaldorn Battle Tank, 
which I think the the real name of this tank should be called the Imperial Fist. Because it's just fun. The Imperial Fist is just going to wreck. It's just going to shove its fist all over the place. But this tank is probably the best tank Games Workshop has ever made. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's immaculate. It's covered in lovely details. It's essentially just a modern earth historic tank with just a little bit of sci-fi added on i would have loved some sort of a plasma option just because i love plasma and i think it really sci-fi is up anything it goes on to but man this tank is incredible clearly this is the new lehman rust battle tank get get out of here old lehman rust battle tank you tiny little weird looking thing this this is the imperial guard tank and i am Super looking forward to it doesn't sound like it's gonna happen But I think they should just scrap all current Imperial Guard tanks and rebuild them based on the modifications and things that they have done on the Imperial Fist because this tank is beautiful It's got it's it's not boxy like classic games workshop tanks I mean literally they just took a modern tank and just rubbed a little bit of 40k on top of it It's beautiful. I absolutely love it it also looks like it comes with tons and tons of bits, which the old Lehman Rust sort of did. It used to come with bits, and then eventually, when they changed some of the sprues for the Lehman Rust, they took those bits and they made them available as a separate sprue that you can buy, which did make the tank look a little better. It had covers for some of the treads, but are you going to buy like a $65 tank and then also buy like a $25 or $35 upgrade sprue just to make that tank look a little bit better? I definitely wouldn't. And I actually don't have any Lehman Russes, although I should because the Gene Stealer cult can take them. But I've always wanted to sort of build an Imperial Guard army that would go alongside my Gene Stealer cult army so that I could mix and match whenever I put together that army. And maybe that would actually help me to get some wins with my Gene Stealer cult because I have never won with that army. But man, everything about this is great. The only flaw... And it's not even a flaw, but the only thing that I see that catches my eye is that it's absolutely covered in guns which is cool because it means that the tank's going to probably be good, and, but it also means that it's going to be a little bit frustrating to actually shoot with this tank. I definitely feel this every time I use my Redemptor Dreadnoughts, but it starts to get a little frustrating. It's like, okay, rolling for the Gatling Cannon, and then roll for the little Gatling Cannon under the arm, and then roll for the Icarus Storm Pod, and then roll for the Storm Bolters. Once you do all of those steps, it starts to not feel as much. Again, more rules makes the game feel a little bit less thematic, Doing all of those different roles starts to separate you from just being a really cool tank doing some damage. Um, it does help that it's a double-edged sword. It does help to make the tank more powerful, more cool. It gives you, as a modeler, more options of what weapons you want to include and bring to your games. But uh, I wouldn't have minded if it maybe had like one big main battle cannon, one, uh, some Sponson cannons, and then maybe like a turret for a little guy on top to play with. But... It is fun. It's got nip. It's got nipple guns, which is always great. It's got melta nipple guns, and it looks like you can replace them with um, some auto cannons. But yeah, this tank. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, I'm so excited. A lot. I think that this is going to be a tank that is going to inspire a lot of golden demon entries because a lot of people absolutely love building like model tanks, and model airplanes, and lovingly recreating all of that grit and grime and dust and ground and landscape. And I definitely think that people who really love that, but can't necessarily take all of those skills and attribute them directly to something from the Warhammer 40,000 universe. This is just a tank. It's literally just an Earth tank. And so I think that we're going to see some really cool, like, Saving Private Ryan Band of Brothers style models that people are going to paint up. And it's going to be amazing. I absolutely love this tank. And at the bottom of this article, it does tease that there will be one more new release for the Imperial Guard. I think we were all expecting that this big tank would be the thing, like the big selling point of the new Imperial Guard and like why you might want to collect Imperial Guard now in 9th edition, now that we're getting a little bit close to 10th edition. But um, there's apparently one more thing. And if I had to guess, I'd have to guess it's going to be Commissar Yarrick because he just got dropped or put into Legends, the old Imperial Guard Yarrick. And I can't imagine that Games Workshop is just going to delete that guy, especially since like, the flagship animation for Warhammer TV was a all-about Yarrick. So, I bet that they bring him back, and they give him, like, a new plastic model, and it's going to look really, really cool. Uh, or maybe they keep going with the uh, the Commissar Creed, and now it's his granddaughter who is leading the Imperial Guard in his stead. Uh, I think he's trapped in a vault in Trazine's library. 
So maybe they're going to have uh, Yarick's nephew. <laughs> Yarick's nephew. And he's not going to have an orc claw. He's going to have like a striking scorpion claw. <laughs> I bet I bet that that's the new, that's the new thing that they're going to be releasing for the Imperial Guard. But yeah, this tank, tank A+, 10 out of 10. Everything about it is perfect. It's really, really cool. But enough of the Rogel Doran tank, or as it should be called, the Imperial Fist. Next up is the new Warcry box, which I actually really liked the look of the old Warcry box. I was a little bit iffy on the terrain, but I actually saw the terrain in person and it's really, really cool. It's big, it's way bigger than it looks in the Games Workshop promotional images. And this bot and this uh, this new Warcry box seems like it's more of the same. Chameleon Skinks, Hunt Jade, Mask, Zinch Cultus, and the new Warcry box, Sundered Fate. Gloomy root halls filled with treasure are just a fragment of the true bounty resting in the heart of the ravaged ruin, the downed Seraphon Temple ship once known as the Eye of Kotek. It's time to venture deeper into Talaxis, where two new warbands are preparing to battle over the mis mysteries found within. It's always so hard to read the Warcry articles because they shove in so much alliteration and so many fake words, but it's also kind of fun. This new box is the same as before. It's got some lovely terrain and two warbands, but finally, finally, it's not a human warband. It is a Seraphon warband, and that actually makes me really, really interested in actually getting my hands on this thing. The powers emanating from the ravening ruins is so rich and intoxicating, more and more warbands are breaching the borders that the Seraphon have drawn around the Eye of Kotek. The hunters of Huan Chi, Huan Chi, the hunters of Hyundai, a stealthy band of Chameleon Skink guardians, don't like that one bit. The Chameleon Skinks are a model from uh, the Seraphon that were in desperate need of a refresh, and I think that this is great. I think that they look wonderful. I love, um, they don't seem to all be armed with blowpipes, but maybe that's fine. Maybe they, maybe you can just assume that they do have a blowpipe hidden somewhere in their clothing. I hate, these guys are so, so cool looking. And they're so silly looking because a chameleon is just like an inherently weird looking animal. It's like exactly just a tiny little triceratops that moves at like a quarter of a mile every day. Just a little tiny thing. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, the chameleons have a very specific hand that is weird looking in terms of how animal hands are. And it seems like these guys just have normal hands. So I would have liked them to just take that little that little thing from nature and include it on the model. But other than that, these models are exceptional. I'm super into them. And the dinosaur lizard stuff doesn't stop there. The cunning chameleon skinks who protect the downed void ship are cold blooded. I don't like that the Seraphon also call their ships void ships because that is confusing because the void is the thing that you travel through in Warhammer 40,000. So they should have just been called like magic ships or ether ships or just don't reuse the same word. I mean, I know there's tons of crossover between the lore of Age of Sigmar and the lore of Warhammer 40,000. So maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about, but I would have liked a little bit of separation just so that, I mean, void ships are a thing. And I guess void ships are also a thing here. They're cold-blooded in their tenacity, confounding their prey with poisoned blowpipes and masterful guerrilla tactics. The armor-clad warriors known as Hyundai's Claws call on their enchanted helms to terrify trespassers with mighty roars, while flocks of trained terror wings harry their foes from above. The terror wings. Uh, the terror wings are like one of the big things that make me want to start Seraphon. Just pterodactyls. I love Jurassic Park 3, as silly as that movie is. The pterodactyls are awesome. Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 all appear in the Michael Crichton novel, Jurassic Park, which is a great book. Very different from the movie, but very good in a totally different way. It's very, it's a very, really cool read. And I believe Jurassic Park is available as an audiobook from Audible, which is where I listen to all of my audiobooks. I absolutely love Audible. I've been a subscriber forever. And we also have a link. And if you use that link, you're not only getting access to one audiobook of your choice, but you're also helping out the channel. These pterodactyls are beautiful. They're so characterful. They've got great poses. Ah, uh, I, th this, I'm probably gonna start Warcry. These guys are so cool. But on the flip side, we also have a new human warband in the Cult of the Jade Obelisk. Hailing from the accursed city of Nefekat. <laughs> These warriors have struck a doomed pact with the eldritch entities known as the Speaker in the Stone gaining great resilience and power at the low, low cost of their bodies slowly turning to stone. That is the 
coolest concept, and it is nowhere on the minis. Perhaps their masks are their face turning to stone, although that doesn't also make sense because how could they have a stone mask and also like be eating stuff and staying alive? Maybe the powers of the eldritch entity known as the Speaker in the Stone is keeping them alive. These models are great. They're super cool. They look very Warcry. But if they were turning to stone, like maybe their arms have already turned to stone, like each one has like one arm that's already turned into a weapon. It's turned into stone and then they've carved their own arm into a weapon. That would be so neat. And maybe the, uh, the magician, the magic wielder of this force has already like 80% stone. But because he's got the powers of the warp, he can like float around and do stuff. While the more uh, weary characters have a lot less stoniness going on. Uh, I wouldn't say that these guys are stoned. I definitely wouldn't on the actual miniatures because there's they have cool decorations and jewelry, but I don't see them actually turning to stone, which is a little bit of a bummer. It's a really cool concept. I don't know if they accidentally just mentioned that in the article or if that's pulled from the uh, the lore that's going to come out in this book, but. That is one tiny little thing that I would have really liked to see. And of course, the terrain is wonderful. The article states, this particular knot of gnarl wood is represented by even more fleshy gnarl oaks. Gnarl oaks, so gnarly oaks. Plus a scattering of palisades and ruins. New to this box are bamboo platforms for your cheeky chameleon skinks to skulk about from on high, plus a comfy hollow refuge which gives a glimpse of how warbands might survive in such hostile environments. Flesh trees. Who doesn't love flesh trees? This train is different from the previous train, but it's in the, it's, it's like the same type of stuff, which means that if you have that box and you add this box to it, you're going to have more of that stuff. And I might, I might have to check on eBay to see if I can get the old terrain. Cause I, I, I liked the old warbands enough, but like, the, if I could get my hands on that terrain for cheap and then add it to this box, uh, that would make for a really cool Warcry and Age of Sigmar battlefield. This stuff is dope. Warcry, Warcry is looking better and better all the time. This box is really, really cool. They have a beautiful picture of all the stuff together with a little bit of uh, a vape smoke to add a little bit of ambiance. It's wonderful. Ah, Warcry, double thumbs up. And speaking of things that probably should have come out a long time ago, the Leagues of Votan are finally, finally available for pre-order. I was like, I was like shocked and reminded of how Games Workshop actually does business because I assumed because it was they did such a push of advertising the Leagues of Votan. And so I was like, OK, Leagues of Votan, are we ready to go? And then the army box came out and sold out in like a couple of minutes and then nothing for like three weeks. It's wild. Like everybody is excited and chomping at the bit to start this new army. Apparently it was banned in Germany for like two and a half minutes before they came out with the uh, the rules update, the errata. And now finally, you're gonna be able to pre-order all any of the 12 units available to the Leagues of Votan. And I mean, it's the same stuff we've seen before, but now you can finally buy it. It was so frustrating. It was such a weird holding pattern that the Leagues of Votan were in where a couple of people had the army box, maybe a few sets of the army box, so they could sort of play a watered down version of the Votan because there were only four different units available in that box. Now you can finally put together the Leagues of Votan. And it just reminded me of that's that's actually how Games Workshop does stuff. They come out with an army box. They just let that exist in the world and sell out unless it's a Black Templar one, which no one wanted. They let that sell out. And then later they actually drop all of the normal things. But I'm really excited not to buy the Leagues of Votan, but I'm just excited for people to get their hands on Leagues of Votan because I want to see all of the really cool color schemes and conversions that people do with these models. I really like everything about the Leagues of Votan. Maybe not the Arthine, Arthine Warriors, the Arthine, the Ionar, Ionar Hearthguard Warriors, the, the Squat Terminators. Those guys are just a little iffy for me, but maybe people are going to come up with some really cool stuff to do with them. And if anybody was wondering about maybe where you should pre-order or try to get the Leagues of Votan, you can always get them from Valhalla Hobby. They're a wonderful little game store that does offer a nice discount on Games Workshop products. And if you shop with the code EOB11, you can get 5% off your first order from Valhalla Hobby. Ooh, one thing I don't know if they showed off before is the Leagues of Votan dice set. And they're nice. They are yellow and orange with the symbol that better be on the six. Yes. 
the symbol, the Leagues of Votan uh, dwarfy face is on the six, which is perfect. Don't ever put it on the one. Don't have two. I've seen I've seen Games Workshop dice sets where there's two different designs, one for the one and one for the six. And so you just have to memorize which one is which and then explain to your opponent which one is a one and which one is a six. And there's a little room for cheating in there. So yeah, good dice. Oh, and cards. Don't buy the cards. It's silly. Don't get the cards. They're dumb. Finally, people can pick up the Leagues of Votan. But the thing that really threw me through a loop this week, the thing that got my blood boiling and just ah, got me hot and bothered was Army Painter put out a video talking about their new development team, including some of my favorite YouTubers. Um, I was not a part of it, but I don't care because I have way too much going on. Also, apparently some of the creators are going to have to come up with colors, which I feel like I would be really bad at. Eons of Blue, there's one, but... Uh, eons of green. Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to the green paint. I don't know. But the thing that really got me in their video was that they're going to be changing the formula for Army Painter Speed Paint so that it no longer reactivates. Congratulations, Internet. You won. You won. You got uh, hashtag Army Painter Speed Paint reactivate problem trending. And so now they took a beautiful, perfect product and are trying to change it so that it better matches Games Workshop's worst product, Contrast Paint. Uh, I have been screaming into the void for like six months. The reactivation is good. It's fine. It's preferable. Speed Paint is an amazing, beautiful, perfect product that is amazing. And now it's going to change slightly. And I don't know anything about how that change is going to work. Um, I'm, but it sucks. It sucks so hard. I'm going to have to now, if I want to put like a really cool scratching tutorial using that reactivation method to quickly get some interesting scratches and changes into the paint quality and consistency on the model. If I want to do that in a video, I now have to wait to get my hands on this new stock of speed paint to make sure that the new speed paint behaves exactly like the old speed paint because like 10 people online complained. It's so frustrating. Speed paint is perfect and the reactivation is perfect. It's uh, it's what's what makes it so much better than contrast paint. Contrast paint dries way too fast and the the army painter speed paint dries much slower. So you get uh, the paint is able to settle and it looks so much better. You don't get any clumpiness with speed paint. And another great thing about speed paint and its reactivation is if I'm painting, you know, a, cl a cloak green and I get a little bit of green on his leg. That's no big deal. I can I can just leave that green on his leg, finish doing a beautiful job painting his cloak, and then just go back with a little water on my brush and just clean that leg up. Perfect. Now, who knows with the new formula, which better have the exact same drawing time. It's hard to believe because like the resin is a really big deal. And if they change the resin formula, it might alter some of the other aspects of the paint. And like if I'm using Games Workshop contrast paint and I get a little bit of green on his leg, I got to deal with that immediately I have to stop painting the cloak, wipe away that error, and then go back to the cloak. And at that point it's dried a little bit and I might get coffee staining in some of the spots where I didn't work fast enough. Um, the only way I've really found to, to work with the speed paint or with the Games Workshop contrast paint is to really glob it on so that it's a thick paint and it stays wet for enough time. And then I have to pull the excess paint off of it, which means that I'm wasting more expensive paint compared to Army Painter Speed Paint, where I am using less, cheaper paint. I love Speed Paint. I love everything about Speed Paint. I have painted like almost uh, almost 150 models at this point. I think I was at 70 models with Army Painter Speed Paint, and then I painted 200 zombies. These aren't mostly with Speed Paint. Um, I use Speed Paint on their loincloths, but Speed Paint is perfect, and they're changing it. So congratulations, Internet. You won. <sighs> Games Workshop Contrast Paint is fine. I really like Black Templar and White Scars. I think those colors work really, really well. But overall, I have actually had way more success with Army Painter Speed Paint. I love everything about it. And now I'm going to have to buy more of it and see if the new stuff behaves exactly like the old stuff so that I know that I'm I'm giving good advice and good tips when I show people how to use Army Painter Speed Paint. Very frustrating. Very annoying. I don't know what to do. It's fine. I'm sure the new formula will be fine. 
Hopefully it won't change anything about the drying time and hopefully you still will have that little bit of reactivation while the paint is still fairly wet or before it is cured fully. Actually, I heard a weird rumor that Army Painter Speed Paint will reactivate with your hands. So I actually have a model painted with Army Painter Speed Paint. This is a good old fashioned Space Marine. Uh, it's a few months old, so let's do a little test. Hey, look at that, nothing came off. Reactivation is not a problem. It's a feature, it's the best thing about the paint. It's what makes it different from the other competition out there, but because it doesn't behave exactly like good old Games Workshop's contrast paint, it is going to change. <sighs> Whatever. The Army Painter Speed Paint announcement put me in a bad mood, but you know what always puts me in a good mood? That's right, our Patreon. Every single month we come out with brand new miniatures and terrain to help populate your wargaming tables. This month we had the Duchess of Paradise and the Spooky Carnival Terrain. Perfect for the spooky month of Halloween. We also come out with one extra episode of Eons of Battle every single week where we take a look at our viewers' models and we give them some helpful critiques and criticism to maybe push them in the right direction. And we do a Discord hangout where we all just hop into a server and chit chat the night away. It is wonderful. And we have merch, link in the description. What a week. Warcry is looking really cool, and maybe I'll use the new formula of Army Painter Speed Paint to paint up some skinks. Thanks for watching.